Okay, so before you read week six, uh, let's just take a look at what we're going to be encountering. First Corinthians 4 through 14, basically. And we've already looked a little bit at, at 1 Corinthians 1 through 3. And so just a quick little reminder, if we pull our map up again, uh, that Paul, Paul was over here in Thessalonica. Then he goes down here to Corinth. And then he ends up over in Ephesus. And the letters we're looking at right now, he's writing these letters uh, to Corinth. And Corinth, remember, was a was a was kind of a wicked, very pagan, wicked, big town, big city. But there was a church there that uh, that had been established, and Paul is trying to write to them to encourage them that they're supposed to live differently than they used to live, that they that they're not supposed to live the way they used to live as pagans, as non Christians. And, and so I want to talk about a few things in this video just to prepare you for these readings. The first thing is I want to talk about black and white issues, black and white issues when it, when it comes to living your, your lives for God. He, he says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. That's a black and white issue. Now he says, I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't associate with people of this world who are immoral or the greedier swindlers or the idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave this world, or certainly they would have to leave Corinth at least. But here's what he's saying. He says, I'm talking about not associating with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but does those things. So it's really interesting that Paul is saying to this, saying to them in their culture, in their context, he's saying, you know, there's this, there's, we should live differently now. And if you're, if you're surrounding yourself, if, if in the church, you've got all these people who claim to be Christians, but are pulling the culture of the church down, they're, they're living in these black and white areas. They're, they're, they're living according to how they want to live. They're not finding out what pleases God in doing it, but they're doing what they want to do. Paul is saying you you have to you have to get away from those people. You you can't associate with those people because those people will end up corrupting the culture of of God's church and it shouldn't be that way. Even if they claim to be, even if they claim to be brothers or sisters, he's giving us a boundary that we're we're supposed to draw, which I think is really good for us to be aware of in the church today. And then he says this in verse 12, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? In other words, I'm not going to judge the Corinthians in general the town, because they're pagan and, and that they don't know better. You know, they're not following Jesus yet. But here's what he says. Are you not to judge those inside? It, 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 in other words, he's saying we're supposed to judge those inside the church. We're supposed to hold each other to a standard. He says God will judge those outside. But as for you, expel the wicked person from among you. Now, uh, you know, for some of you, this you might be like, well, wait, I thought the Bible said we're not supposed to judge. Well, I mean, Jesus says that in, in Matthew, but he, but look at if you look at the context, it's different than the context here. The context here, Paul is talking to Christians and how the, how they should view people, other Christians who are who are clearly in the wrong when it comes to black and white issues like sexual immorality, for example. And and what Paul says is, yes, we're supposed to judge those people, hold them accountable, hold them to a Christian standard. So uh, w as you read that, pay attention to how he says that. And then, then if we go on to the next section in, in chapters 8 through 10, he's talking about what I would call not black and white issues, but now he's going to be talking about gray issues. And here was one of the gray issues, food sacrifice to idols. See, here was the situation. You had Jews in the church, and then you had Gentiles in the church. The culture of the Gentiles was totally different than the culture of the Jews. The Jews had food laws that, that they had to obey. And so as a result of that, a Jewish person, even if he was a Christian, had a difficult time um, f eating food sacrificed to idols, even though he knew that, that idols were, were nothing and it was no big deal. But still, culturally, it was very difficult for a Jew to bring himself to eat food sacrificed to idols. Um, and so he wouldn't do... Now, again, it's not that they were sacrificing to idols, but it was... It was food sacrificed to idols in the pagan ritual, and then it would be sold at the market. And, and they were, it was usually cheaper, so a Gentile, would, out of good stewardship, would buy, would buy the cheaper meat. You know? and a, but a Jew didn't feel comfortable doing that. And so it, it became a little bit of an issue in the church. And, and what Paul is saying is this. See, the Gentiles didn't have a problem with it at all. But in the church, you had, these, the, you had this kind of dividing line between these two. And it, it, became an, a gray, it was a gray area that, was, that, that became a little divisive in the church. Maybe we could relate it to, in our church today, some people uh, feel comfortable 
because of how they were raised, some people feel comfortable having a, having a beer and other people don't feel comfortable having a beer. Um, you know, that's a gray issue. As long as we're not talking about drunkenness, it's a gray issue and it can become divisive in the church. And here's what he says. We know that we all possess knowledge. You know, he's, he's kind of talking to the, to the Greeks, to the Jews or the Gentiles here. He's saying, you guys know, I know that you know the right stuff about this, that an idol is nothing. But here's what he's saying. Knowledge puffs up and love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. In other words, what he's saying is, if you're going to, he's speaking of the Gentiles, if you're going to use your knowledge as a, as a reason to sort of, sort of flaunt your freedom in the face of the Jews because, you're, because you don't have this cultural hang-up like they do, what he's saying to them is that that's not the right thing to do. Even though maybe the, the, you have the truth and, and you're thinking truthfully, but the way you apply it is hurting your brother because, again, a Gentile, if a Gentile would eat food sacrificed to idols in front of a Jew, then, then that, that, would, you know, that would be hurtful for the Jew. That would be hard for the Jew to process. And, and Paul is trying to say to the Gentile, don't put your knowledge above love. love. Love needs to be first and foremost. He says it like this later in chapter 10. He says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. So here, here's what he's saying is, Gentile, even though that your knowledge, you might be right technically, you can be right and still be wrong if you're causing your brother to stumble. So maybe how I would apply this today is maybe you feel okay about having a beer and it's never been a problem for you and you've never overindulged, you've never gotten drunk, and you're out to dinner with a friend that you know has struggled with that, who maybe is an ex-alcoholic, it would be good for you not to drink a beer and cause them to stumble. Even though you have freedom to and, and it's no big deal for you, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. The point is love builds up. Never use your knowledge as kind of a, a trump card and, uh, and, and sort of flaunt your knowledge or your freedom. Here's what he says. Uh, Paul, the principle here is, I am not seeking my own good, but the good of the many. I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of the many. It's about being a servant. It's, it's, about, but it's about considering someone else first. And again, we're talking about gray areas, like, like eating food sacrificed to idols. We're not talking about chapter 5 stuff, which is black and white stuff, sexual immorality. One more thing then, and, it, and it, it, kind of how it applies to the church in general publicly, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, what you'll finish up with this week, um, he, he's talking about... Uh, gifts in the church. He's talking about gifts in the church. See, what happened is there were all these gifts in the church and um, these spiritual gifts. And, and in the church, it was kind of getting a little bit out of control. People were, were almost wearing those these spiritual gifts as kind of a badge of, of honor. And, and, and they were sort of missing the point for the spiritual gifts that it wasn't about, hey, look at me, I'm a great teacher, or look at me, I have this gift of prophecy or whatever. It, he, he, and this is what he's getting to in chapter 13. He says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of, or of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So here he's coming back to love again. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have this incredible faith that can move mountains, but if I don't have love, who cares? I'm nothing. I, it doesn't matter what I have. If, if, I, if I have this great gift of prophecy or knowledge or faith, if, or if I'm really good at giving, if I give all I possess to the poor, if I give over my body to hardship, if I'm willing to sacrifice even my physical well-being so that I, so that I may boast, but if I have not love, I gain nothing. See, here's what, he, here's what he's saying is, and this, this can happen in the church today too, that when, if we forget about love, then we can really get off track. If we forget about loving one another, just kind of a real basic thing, like Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength. And then the next commandment is this, love your neighbor as yourself. And that's what Paul's saying is, I don't care how spiritual you think you are. I don't, think how, I don't care how, how knowledgeable, how wise, how smart you think you are. If you don't love people, you're not as smart as you think you are. If you don't love people, you're not as faithful as you think you are. If you don't love people, you, 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 all of your gifts, whatever they are, are pointless. They're meaningless. They're nothing because love is so important. And he, in chapter 14, he, he kind of, he's talking specifically about the gift of tongues. 
But he says, so, so it is with you. See, they had used this gift of tongues in a in a way that they'd sort of forgotten what it was all about. And it was becoming just this weird thing in the church. And he says, since you're so eager for the gifts of the Spirit, he says, try to excel in the gifts that build up the church. In other words, gifts that are that are about strengthening and edifying someone else, not just about you. He's saying, don't be so selfish. Don't be so self-centered. So if there's any theme in 1 Corinthians 4 through 14, I would say the theme is selflessness, you know, uh, being selfless and, and pursuing God and pursuing God who is love, you know, whether it's in terms of black and white areas and being selfless and honoring God with your bodies, whether it's in the gray areas and being selfless and loving your brother and sister and even giving up some of your freedoms out of love for your brother and sister, or whether it's giving, you know, giving up the way you look at how gifted you are or, or the role that you can play in the church. Again, if it's if it's not with love in mind, then it means nothing and it is nothing. So read through those chapters now, read them again, maybe come back to this video if you need to, to watch it again. But there's some really powerful stuff that really applies to our lives today.